a good morning or afternoon to you. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jan Reichert, Chief Operating Officer of the Antibody Society. Today's webinar is one in a series designed to inform and educate our members and the broader scientific community about topics relating to antibody discovery and development. I'm very pleased to introduce our expert speaker, Dr. Heather Bax, who is the 2023 recipient of the James S. Houston Antibody Science Talent Award. Jim was a visionary and scientist extraordinaire, as well as the founder of the Antibody Society. You can find more information about Dr. Bax and the award under the speaker bio tab in the viewer. Today, Dr. Bax will tell us about IgE antibody therapeutics for cancer. Please note the webinar is being recorded. Please do add any and all questions to the Q&A box in the viewer and those questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. Without further ado, I'll now turn the show over to our speaker. Thank you very much. It really is a pleasure to be here and to share the work today. So um, before I start, um, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about myself and my background and what's brought me to looking at um, Ig antibodies um, for cancer. So um, I completed my PhD with Professor, Professor Hannah Gould and um, Professor Brian Sutton at King's College London. And here I was focusing on the interaction between Ig antibodies um, and mast cells in the context of allergic diseases. And then in 2014, I joined the lab of Professor Sophia Kragianis, also at King's College London. And here I undertook multidisciplinary research um, on the preclinical development of the first in class Ig um, anti cancer antibody, MOV18 Ig. Um, as well as leading the preclinical studies of CSPG4 IG. And as part of this role, I established and implemented several clinical trial assays to support the first in class phase one clinical trial. And collectively, this is the work that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, I now support a translational research program, which is funded by the King's College London spin out, Epsilogen. Limited, which is the first company focusing on Ig immunotherapies for cancer. And I declare patents um, on antibodies for cancer. So the content of my talk today will be why are we looking at Ig therapeutics for cancer? I'll introduce MOB18 and CSPG4 Ig antibodies and the preclinical functional and mechanistic studies of these IGs. Um, I'll address preclinical safety assessments and then um, we'll go on to the first in class phase one clinical trial of MOV18 IgE. So, why are we developing Ig therapeutics for cancer? To date, all monoclonal antibody cancer therapeutics are of one antibody class, that's IgG. However, some tumours remain refractory to this type of treatment. And one strategy for improvement is the development of therapeutic antibodies of alternative isotypes. Um, and there are other groups that are working to develop anti-cancer IgA and IgM antibodies. The field of allergo-oncology is broadly concerned with the interface between TH2, TH2 immune responses, Ig immunity, um, allergy and cancer. And in fact, there's a NIACI um, working group um, on allergo oncology if you're interested in looking that up. And as part of this field, it was hypothesized that monoclonal Ig antibodies um, that target tumor um, associated antigens um, may mediate potent immune activating um, functions in tissues that result in anti tumor activity. So um, I'll just take a little bit of a step back and uh, recap Ig antibodies um, and their key characteristics, which um, we particularly thought were um, important in, in this work. So Ig is one of the five um, 
uh, classes of antibodies. It binds with a very, very high affinity to its FC epsilon R1 receptor, which is expressed on basophils, mast cells, dendritic cells, eosinophils, monocytes, and macrophages, and also to a low affinity receptor called CD23, which is expressed on subsets of B cells and Th2 stimulated monocytes and macrophages. Ig antibodies are well known for their role in mediating allergic reactions and also the powerful effective functions of Ig have been implicated in defense against uh, parasites or venoms. So therefore the properties of um, Ig antibodies that may be advantageous when it comes to developing anti-cancer therapeutics include this high affinity for cognate FC receptors, which are expressed on potent immune effector cells, which are found to be infiltrating tumor lesions. So this um, could result in prolonged um, tissue residency and engagement and activation of these tumor resident immune effector cells, resulting in the orchestration of potent effector functions. So taken together, tumor antigen specific Ig antibodies may recruit and activate aspects of the patient immunity and the tumor microenvironment that are not normally accessed by IgG class antibodies. So this may offer improved efficacy, or it may be that IgEs could complement the existing armamentarium of approved tumor targeting um, antibody therapies. So a number of anti-cancer Ig antibodies have been uh, developed. Um, however, I've had a key role in the development of MOV18 and CSPG4 IgEs. And um, so I'll be sharing the story of um, these um, antibodies today. MOV18 IgE um, targets the ovarian um, cancer-associated antigen folate receptor alpha, which is overexpressed in up to 60% of high-grade serous ovarian uh, tumours and is minimally um, expressed in normal tissue uh, with a number of examples shown here on the right. Um, the selection, the target selection of folate receptor alpha is supported by a regulatory approval of the folate receptor alpha targeting um, antibody drug conjugate, an ADC called Mervatuximab suavtanzin, um, and that regulatory approval um, happened last year. Um, on the other hand, CSPG4 IG targets the melanoma associated antigen of the same name, which is um, expressed by over 60% of malignant melanomas um, with low or no expression on normal skin. And similarly, preclinical and clinical studies of several CSPG4 targeting therapies um, have shown preliminary efficacy and safety. Throughout my talk, data specifically related to MOV18 IgE will be shown in this um, sort of minty green box and CSPG4 IgE in the red pink box. So, um, both antibodies were engineered firstly with human epsilon constant domains for preclinical studies and of course the clinical trial of MOV18 IG in humans, but also with rat epsilon constant domains um, for other um, in vivo mechanistic studies and in vivo safety assessments in immunocompetent syngeneic rat models. The choice for rat for an immunocompetent model was due to the better recapitulation of the human IgEFC receptor system as compared to mouse or cyanomolgus monkey. And if that's something you're interested in looking into further, I would suggest um, you take a look at Saul et al in MAPS published in 2014. So now on to the preclinical functional mechanistic studies of MOV18 and CSPG4 IG. We assessed um, these two IgEs for biophysical properties um, and showed specific cell surface binding to human cancer cell lines, either ovarian or melanoma. 
We um, also showed that CSPG4 IG binds to um, human melanoma uh, tissues, including uh, to metastases and across all stages of disease and showed that CSPG4 IG um, does not bind across many or has no or no or low um, binding to um, many uh, non-malignant normal um, uh, human tissues. Both MOV18 and CSPG4 IG antibodies function in vitro. So we showed that the IGs trigger degranulation when um, RBOS at 38 basophilic like cells are sensitized with the IgE and then co incubated with um, uh, target antigen expressing uh, tumor cells. These tumor cells act as a cross linker and trigger degranulation of the basophil like cells. And um, the two IGs also trigger antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity in an assay where. Um, uh, human immune effector cells are uh, co-cultured with uh, target expressing tumor cells and the IgEs. Um, we can show that this was the case for um, either ov ovarian or melanoma um, cancer cells, and this could be mediated by healthy volunteer and ca uh, cancer patient derived immune effector cells. And in particular, I'm showing here um, monocytes, which are a key FC epsilon receptor expressing immune cell. And um, uh, as you'll see later in the talk, um, really came to be a key immune effector um, cell when um, it came to our studies of uh, anti-cancer IgEs. So in vivo, we observed inhibition of human ovarian cancer cell growth in uh, skid mice treated with human MOV18 IgE together with human PBMCs. We uh, saw prolonged survival of human ovarian xenograft bearing nude mice that had been reconstituted with human PBMCs and treated with human MOV18 IgE and also tumor growth restriction in an immunocompetent syngenetic rat model that were where um, the, the rats were treated with the rat, the surrogate rat MOV18 um, Ig antibody. And you'll see that in all of these models, the efficacy of MOV18 Ig appeared to be superior to the counterpart MOV18 IgG. In terms of CSPG4 IgE, similarly, we demonstrated anti-tumor activity in a human melanoma xenograft mouse model uh, engrafted with human effector cells. And this is shown here by superior tumor growth restriction um, with weekly and fortnightly dosing with CSPG4 IgE as compared to the controls and the CSPG4 IgG antibody. Um, we showed tumor growth restriction by CSPG4 IgE in xenograft models that were engrafted with immune cells derived from melanoma patients. And we showed prolonged um, survival of uh, melanoma patient derived xenograft bearing mice that were treated, that were reconstituted with autologous um, immune cells from the same melanoma patient and treated with CSPG4 IgE. So by studying excised tumors from these in vivo models, we showed that this anti-tumor activity um, is associated with upregulation of immune and pro-inflammatory signatures. This includes signatures for FC epsilon R1, NK cells, IL-12, IL-1, interferon, and TNF. And we saw that enhanced macrophage infiltration and enriched monocyte and macrophage gene signatures were observed in the tumors from IgE-treated um, animals as compared to the PBS controls or IgG-treated uh, animals. And in fact, we showed um, that the in vivo tumor, in vivo tumor growth um, 
restriction uh, by the IG antibodies required the presence of monocytes within the PBMCs that were used to engraft um, the immunodeficient mice. And as you can see here, efficacy was ablated by monocyte depletion. So we uh, saw good um, survival with PBMCs plus IgE. When we depleted um, the uh, monocytes from the PBMCs, uh, this efficacy was ablated. And in the case of um, the MOV18 experiment, uh, was uh, restored by um, adding the monocytes back in. So we were really uh, getting a lot of evidence of the key role of monocytes or macrophages. And so we did some further evaluation on how those cells might be re-educated by um, uh, IgE. So first, we measured elevated levels of pro-inflammatory mediators um, such as MCP1, TNF-alpha and IL-6 um, in the supernatants of some of those in vitro ADCC assays um, performed either with MOV18 IG or CSPG4 IgE. And furthermore, we showed that um, cross-linking of CSPG4 IgE um, bound to receptors on the surface of primary monocytes stimulated those um, monocytes towards pro-inflammatory phenotypes as um, seen there on the bottom right uh, by an upregulation of uh, pro-inflammatory cell surface markers. So in fact, following some more in-depth study of the actions of those key cytokines in vitro, we came up with this hypothesis of a of a of the uh, where IgE may potentiate a TNF alpha MCP1 axis and promote macrophage recruitment. So I'll walk you through that. So initially within tumors, we hypothesized that uh, cross-linking of IgE on macrophages by target antigen expressing tumor cells uh, induces macrophage TNF alpha expression. This um, TNF alpha itself promotes MCP1 production by human cancer cells and um, human monocytes. And this MCP1 putatively acts as a potent chemoattractant, bringing further monocytes or macrophages into the tumor. So overall, there may be a, a, an enhanced tumor cell macrophage interaction of further stimulating production of TNF alpha and then MCP1. And this could form a self enhancing um, circuit of macrophage influx into those Ig treated tumors where we know macrophages are already, they're being drawn in, and then in the presence of IgE, they're able to induce more tumor cell death. So having given you an overview of um, the preclinical efficacy and mechanistic studies of MOV18 IgE and CSPG4 IgE, I'd like to now go on to preclinical safety assessments. This was key because there are known functions of Ig um, antibodies in allergy and type 1 hypersensitivity, and therefore there is a perceived risk with Ig immunotherapies. So Ig immune complexes could form uh, with potentially serum antigen and autoantibodies to that antigen or other cross-linking mediators. Forming an immune complex on the surface of mast cells and basophils which could trigger their degranulation and induce systemic hypersensitivity. So to try to make early assessments of this hypersensitivity ex vivo, we first utilized um, this RBL s 38 basophilic cell line degranulation assay that I'd previously described, but together with patient sera. So this patient sera may potentially contain such cross-linking mediators. And so we, um, use the assay, sensitize the, the mast cells or the basophilic cells with our um, Ig therapeutics in the presence of sera and assess degranulation. So despite there being elevated levels of soluble antigen measurable in ovarian patient sera, as you can see at the top here, we saw no degranulation of RBLS at 38 cells um, following 
incubation with MOV18 IG together with serum. And similarly, we saw no degranulation of these cells when they were incubated with CSPG4 IG in the presence of healthy volunteer or melanoma patient um, sera. So then we also went on to develop a basophil activation test. So this is an assay which is more widely used in the field of allergy research. It utilizes unfractionated whole blood, meaning that any potential mediators um, to form an immune complex, any potential mediators of basophil activation that are found in that individual's circulation are present within the test alongside the therapeutic that you're adding in, an, in the ex vivo um, assay. But as I said, this is this assay is well established in the, the field of allergy research, but really not utilized so much in when it comes to cancer patient blood samples. So first we had to develop the assay um, and assess basophils in cancer patient blood. So you can see here that we were able to clearly detect CCR3 high side scatter low basophils within um, unfractionated whole blood um, samples from um, patients with ovarian cancer. We showed that these basophils express FC epsilon R1 and um, some of them carry um, endogenous IgE bound to those receptors. And similarly, we were able to detect um, basophils in the blood um, from melanoma patients. We then wanted to assess the capacity of these basophils to be activated ex vivo. So we stimulated them ex vivo with a number of control immune stimuli, anti fc epsilon R1 and anti-IgE to cross-link in an IgE-dependent manner, and FMLP uh, to stimulate the basophils in a non-IgE-dependent um, manner. And we showed that um, across a large number of ovarian cancer patients and um, melanoma patients, uh, the, the basophils within these samples did have the capacity to be activated ex vivo within this ass these assays. Um, it was the case for the majority of patients that the basophils could be activated by all of the stimuli, um, If, uh, but in some cases uh, this was only seen by Ig or non-Ig dependent um, mechanisms, but fundamentally we were happy. We had an assay, it had a positive control, but um, the the basophils from cancer patient um, blood could be activated um, and had the capacity to be activated ex vivo. But in order to study the potential for hypersensitivity to anti-cancer IgE antibodies, we then had to establish that exogenous IgE added within the assay could bind to the blood um, circulating basophils and could be cross-linked to trigger an activation. So we incubated unfractionated whole blood from our patients um, with a, a haptin-specific NIP IgE together with its multimeric antigen, NIP-BSA, and we showed that these, this um, convincingly triggered uh, basophil activation. So this really suggested that IgE could recognize the, any unoccupied cell surface F6 on R1 receptors on um, these basophils ex vivo, and the basophils could be activated by um, uh, engagement of FC epsilon R1 and formation of uh, cross-linking immune uh, complexes. So having established the assay uh, and uh, shown the, um, that across the board uh, basophils could be activated ex, uh, ex vivo, um, we did not see uh, basophil activation triggered by MOV18 or control IgE in the blood of, uh, of the ovarian cancer patients uh, shown here or studied here. This was the case in all but one of the 42 patients I'm showing here. And to date, no basophil activation was triggered by CSPG4 IgE or control IgE in melanoma patient blood. And again, these data are supported by the confirmation um, 
of, of, of the binding of the exogenous Ig2 basophils in cancer patient blood samples, and we showed this here by um, fluorescently labelling our antibody. So taken together, these degranulation and this, these BAT assays did provide us with the preliminary evidence of an absence of type 1 hypersensitivity to Ig therapeutics um, that we needed as part of the preclinical study of, of, of these um, antibodies. But of course, we saw that one in 42 of the ovarian cancer patients did seem to, um, that MOV18 did seem to trigger basophil activation ex vivo. And so we certainly wanted to investigate the, the mechanism behind this. So as I already mentioned, MOV18 Ig targets folate receptor alpha. We know within our own co cohorts that subsets of um, ovarian cancer patients do have soluble um, folate receptor alpha, the, the antigen in the sera, and also anti-folate receptor alpha autoantibodies. And as I've explained, these together could form an immune uh, complex formation in the, in the circulation, triggering basophil activation when uh, MOV18 is is um, is included within the assay. Um, so this was an obvious uh, thought for the potential mechanism. Um, but in fact, basophil activation by MOV18 IG or the lack thereof in these studies was irrespective of whether the patient had a tumour that was positive for folate receptor alpha expression. It was irrespective of the presence of uh, soluble folate receptor alpha or anti-folate receptor alpha autoantibodies in the circulation or both of those um, mediators. The one patient that had basophil activation by MOV18 IG did have detectable soluble folate receptor alpha, but not autoantibodies. Um, and uh, we really do believe that the soluble folate receptor alpha is um, uh, monomeric and, and not triggering uh, activation on its own. So um, we really felt that this mechanism was independent of folate receptor alpha positivity. And this is something that we wanted to continue to explore. And I'm going to pick up on again later um, in the presentation. So just to finalize, uh, come to the end of this, this section on um, safety, um, we did perform uh, preclinical safety studies of MOV18 and CSPG4 IgE. These were um, performed in those immunocom syngeneic immunocompetent rat models that I described with the surrogate rat IgE antibodies. Um, this, that's a lot of work. I won't cover it today. So I'm going to instead direct you to the, the key publications shown here. So finally, um, on to the first in class phase one clinical trial of MOV18 IgE. Um, this uh, phase one clinical trial was sponsored by um, CRUK and ran um, within the UK uh, at four different um, hospital sites, one of which was uh, Guy's, where we're based. And as I said, uh, part of my role had been to develop a number of the assays for this clinical trial. And together with colleagues, as the trial was ongoing, we ran, ran a number of the samples in those assays. So. Patients with um, any solid tumour that was expressing folate receptor alpha as, as according to our immunohistochemical assay were eligible. You can see some examples of um, a negative in the top left and then positive in, in the other three. Um, however, um, of the 26 patients that were recruited to the trial, they all um, had either ovarian epithelial cancer, ovarian tubal carcinoma, or endometrial cancer. Um, we had originally considered other um, cancer types uh, that are known to express folate receptor alpha, including TMBC, mesothelioma, um, et cetera. But in fact, they were not the patients that we ended up recruiting to the trial. From a safety perspective, um, we utilise intradermal or skin prick testing. 
So here we used a um, solution of MOV18 IG. Um, this was performed prior to every dose. And the rationale was to predict hypersensitivity to MOV18 IG. And this would, would be predicted by a wheel and flare reaction, which would be analogous to those seen in classical cutaneous allergy testing that's performed um, with solutions of allergen. Overall, 24 patients were treated with up to six uh, weekly IgE and um, intravenous infusions. This was at escalating doses that ranged from 70 microgram to 12 milligrams. That's a flat dose per individual. And patients that were potentially benefiting, so those after those six weekly doses that showed stable disease or response and didn't have any intolerable toxicities, they were able then to continue with three subsequent maintenance doses that were given at reduced two weekly frequency. All the patients on the trial had received prior systemic therapy. In many cases, they had been multiply pretreated. So, in terms of the pharmacokinetics of um, MOV18, following uh, the IV um, administration. We had developed and utilized an ELISA to specifically detect the level of MOV18 IG in patient serum samples. And um, we're showing here that systemic exposure as measured by CMAX and area under the curve was observed to increase in a dose proportional manner. And the mean terminal elimination half-life uh, was 9.4 hours and the mean total body clearance was 2.81 litres per hour. Um, and this um, was consistent across uh, the cohorts um, and uh, the doses that were studied. So MOV18 was um, generally well tolerated uh, with, um, in the great majority of um, patients and uh, in, in the majority of individuals, uh, the adverse events were low grade. Um, most commonly, they were seen as localized cutaneous uh, toxicities, such as urticaria pruritus, rash, um, erythema. And these always resolved within hours of dosing. And they were not associated with any systemic signs or symptoms or the elevation of serum tryptase. Um, this was the case for all individuals except for one, and I will come on to them. So this phase four activation test that I've already described to you that we had developed and used preclinically was utilized as a monitoring companion in the phase one clinical trial alongside other clinical safety parameters. So we assessed patient blood um, at baseline and after the first and the third um, infusions. As you can see here, the case, this is the data for all of the patients. Uh, marked base for activation was measured in response to ex vivo stimulation of the patient blood with those positive um, control immune stimuli, but not in uh, response to stimulation with MOV18 or control IgE. And we, we described this lack of base for activation by MOV18 as a negative BAT. And this negative result was maintained um, when the bat was performed after the first and the third um, infusion as well. Um, so this picture was, uh, was the case for all of the trial um, subjects, excluding a single patient. In this single patient, the baseline bat prior to any infusion predicted the single anaphylactic reaction to MOV18 IgE infusion that we saw within the trial. So here at baseline for this individual, MOV18 IgE stimulation ex vivo triggered a 17 fold increase in base flow activation. This patient then experienced a grade three anaphylaxis upon the first infusion, the, the subsequent um, and first infusion of MOV18 IgE. This was 500 microgram dose. And this anaphylaxis was confirmed by raised serum tryptase two hours post dose. In fact, when we performed the base flow activation test, 
um, using blood taken uh, immediately after the episode of anaphylaxis. There was no activation by MOV18 IgE. Um, and we felt that this was likely to, as a result of uh, basophil depletion. As you can see here, the proportion of basophils in the, that whole blood sample was significantly depleted following the anaphylaxis with a slow recovery um, after that. This wasn't the case for all of the other patients shown here in the inset where um, the proportion of basophils uh, did not change significantly um, over the course of the trial. Um, so. Following this episode, uh, sensitivity to MOV18 IgE in a baseline bat then became an exclusion criteria um, for the trial to ensure that no um, further patients received with re reactive basophils received um, a treatment. So again, of course, we were interested in the mechanism, what was triggering this anaphylaxis for this, uh, this single patient. And unfortunately, this is yet to be elucidated, but I'll walk you through everything that we've excluded in our thoughts so far. So as I said, skin prick testing is performed before every single infusion. And in this case, the skin prick test did not predict the anaphylaxis. This is an example here, but there was no wheel or flare to MOV18 IG in the patient that then went on to have anaphylaxis. So the skin prick test was not predictive. The BAT was. Um, the patient did not have detectable uh, folate, soluble folate receptor alpha or antifolate receptor alpha autoantibodies in their circulation. Uh, these are the mediators I've previously described that could cross-link MOV18 IgE and trigger activation of basophils. In the trial, there was one patient that had both of these mediators detectable within their circulation, but they didn't have any symptoms of systemic reaction when they had their MOV18 IgE infusions. Um, we looked at anti-drug antibodies uh, that um, could have formed against MOV18 IgE or be present um, at baseline uh, for, for, for whatever reason. The patient uh, having anaphylaxis did not have detectable um, ADAs um, and there were there were ADAs detected in three of the patients within the trial. These were at later time points, so after the sixth infusion or even at the, the follow-up 28 days after the end of the study. But again, these individuals had shown no signs or symptoms of systemic reaction when they had their MOV18 IG infusions. And finally, we assessed anti-alpha-gal IgE antibodies in patient circulation. So we thought this was particularly important um, because IgE antibodies are highly glycosylated in comparison to IgGs. You can see the schematic there in the bottom right. And in particular, MOV18 IgE is produced in sp20 cells, which are known to decorate um, antibodies with alpha-gal. Um, so again, if this individual had anti-alpha-gal IgE antibodies, those could act to cross-link MOV18 IgE on the surface of basophils and trigger the, the hypersensitivity. But the patient with anaphylaxis did not have elevated levels of anti-alpha-gal IgE antibodies. As you can see here, we did have one individual that did have um, elevated levels that we could measure, um, um, but once again, this individual did not show any signs of systemic reaction when they had their infusions. But just coming back, what could be the mechanism of this anaphylaxis in this one patient? It may still be that glycosylation such as alpha-gal or other sugars on MOV18 IG could be responsible. So this, what we're measuring here is anti-alpha-gal IgE antibodies because they're what are responsible for um, reactions to other um, therapeutic antibodies such as cetuximab that express alpha-gal. Um, because you, in that case, you need it to be an IgE that's binding to the basophil and the cetuximab in effect acts as the cross-linker and triggers the hypersensitivity. In the case of MOV18 IgE, Actually, if our patient had anti-alpha-gal of another isotype, so an IgG, for instance, so 
IgG recognizing these sugars, that could act as a cross-linker. As yet, there's no assay that's been developed to evaluate this, but we're working on it. And I think that we should go along that avenue and also consider other sugars, um, because that may, may be uh, help, uh, fruitful. However, I, I, my thinking is that the, the mechanism is likely to be um, different for different patients. And I think we have to, and when we come across individuals that are predicted to be hypersensitive in a, in a BAT assay, we have to look at them as individuals and consider the mechanism for that individual only. So finally, in terms of early evidence of efficacy, um, we are really um, pleased to show that one patient with platinum resistant mixed high grade serous endometrioid ovarian carcinoma who was treated with 700 micrograms of MOV18 IG exhibited a 52% reduction in the serum CA125 tumor marker. However, um, the tumor marker reduction was not sustained beyond 28 days and because of this did not meet formal criteria for response. Furthermore, the patient's on treatment scan after the six weekly infusions of MOV18 IgE revealed a resolution of ascites and short-lived shrinkage of um, peritoneal tumor deposits although these didn't amount to resist partial response. And unfortunately at 12 weeks and following the per protocol reduction of dosing frequency to the two weekly um, uh, frequency, the, the patient scan and the tumor marker had, did, develop, uh, did demonstrate a disease progression. So, um, just to summarize um, what I've presented today, I hope I've convinced you that there is potential in Ig-based cancer immunotherapies and that this is supported by the preclinical studies and the phase one clinical testing of MOV18 IgE. I've shown you that both Ig antibodies demonstrate function in vitro. In vivo, um, we showed anti-tumor activity in across disparate models and that this Ig activity um, was associated with enriched pro-inflammatory signatures and uh, monocyte macrophage polarization and macrophage infiltration within tumors. Um, I've shown you our evidence for an absence of pre uh, 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 preliminary um, evidence of type 1 hypersensitivity that we observed ex vivo and the now completed uh, phase 1 clinical trial of um, MOV18 indicates um, the safety profile is tolerable and um, the maximum tolerated dose has not yet been reached um, and the anti-tumor activity um, was observed in, in that patient with ovarian cancer. So more broadly I I think it's um, there's the possibility that Ig antibody cancer therapy therapies for uh, other anti antigens uh, could be developed and explored. So these may be um, antigens that are already validated as targets for IgG um, antibody therapeutics or other um, anti antigens that are overexpressed on other solid tumors. And it would be particularly uh, helpful, I think, to look at uh, uh, cancer types that don't currently have um, tumor targeting um, uh, therapies available. So um, I want to express uh, thanks to uh, my supervisors and mentors, Professor Sophia Kragianis and Professor S um, James Spicer, and also to Dr. Deborah Josephs, who's a longtime collaborator and friend, and um, shown these three down here, Jitesh Chohan, Dr. Melanie Granditz, and Dr. Lais Paliares, with whom I work very closely. Um, also shown here are present and some key past um, members of the Karagiannis group, um, my colleagues within Guy's and St. Thomas's NHS Foundation Trust, and of course the patients and healthy volunteers who made the studies possible. So here I direct you to the key publications that I've covered today, and um, I welcome your questions.
Thank you very much. And we do have any number of questions here. I'll start with uh, some of the early ones and some of the easier ones, I think. What is the best method to express and purify recombinant IgEs? Uh, well, um, so uh, we've used a number of methods over the years. Um, we definitely, uh, we, we went from using two vectors, one, one vector for heavy chain, one vector to light chain, to a, a, a different system. So we use P-Vitro, we've used UCOE expression um, vectors for stable cell lines, um, and then we're definitely expressing in mammalian cell lines, but which cells I think is a, a, a topic for discussion and debate. Um, purification of IgE, as, as, again, is a challenge, so there aren't the tools that are available for IgGs, but we have developed that, um, and now we're lucky that there is a um, commercially available uh, affinity matrix uh, specific for IgE that we're utilizing, and that works really well. We can produce enough to run clinical trials. Next question, have natural IgE antibodies been detected to either of the antigens that you were talking about? Um, to either of the antigens, well, that's a really interesting question. So I thought the question was going to be, have they been detected and is that associated with risk for cancer? So there's a lot of epidemiological studies um, that suggest that IgE might be protective, but it really depends on the cancer. So it's a mixed picture. Um, in terms of antifolate receptor alpha or anti-CSPG4 IgEs in patients with ovarian cancer or melanoma, I don't think so, and I'm not sure we've looked. So that's a really interesting question. Thank you very much. Question on half-life. IgE has a log fold lower half-life compared to IgG. How do you envision this will affect efficacy and what will this mean for dosing regimens compared to IgG antibodies? Exactly. So you can see from our PK data that um, the clearance is very fast. So we know that naturally Ig um, is resides in the circulation only for a matter of days compared to a couple of weeks for IgG, but the reverse is true when it comes to tissue. So IgG is not found in the tissue for more than a few days, but IgE can reside there for up to two weeks. And that's because it has this really high affinity to those tissue resident immune effector cells. And that's one of the key characteristics that we think could be a, a real positive for IgE. So in terms of dosing, it's something that we're really looking at. We need to do more work. We need to study in animals and in humans as we dose more individuals. But our hypothesis is that the, you dose at IgE and then it gets picked up by those cells and trafficked to the tumor. Um, so actually, you don't need huge amounts in the circulation at any one time you want it to get to the target. Next question, incorporation of rat epsilon protein or domain in the antibody will likely trigger immunogenic reactions. Is that correct? How can those reactions be minimized? Yes, yeah, so um, I hope maybe I wasn't, perhaps I wasn't clear enough. So we developed uh, two types, two antibodies for each mob 18 and CSPG4, so either with a human backbone or a rat backbone. The human backbone antibody was used in our mouse models that were immunodeficient and we were constituted with human immune effect cells, so the human Ig binds to a human immune effect cells in a mouse. And we, we made the rat um, surrogate antibodies for that immunocompetent rat model. So we wanted this model. We knew that rat IgE uh, uh, system most closely resembled a human other than compared to another species. So we wanted an immunocompetent model with its own immune system where we could um, use a syngeneic, so that's a tumor from the same species, from the same uh, strain. Um, so that it was a complete system. And so for that, we needed a, a rat antibody to bind to the rat immune cells. In, the, in a human clinical trial, it's a human IgE. I hope that that answers the question. Thanks very much for that clarification. Next question, IgE is approximately 40 kilodalton larger in size compared to IgG. Yes. What is known about how this feature might affect 
target tissue penetration and therefore target engagement, particularly in solid tumors. Yeah, well, that's really interesting. I mean, yes, they're very different. So IgG has a hinge and IgE doesn't have the hinge. Instead, it has an additional uh, constant domain. So it has four epsilon constant domains. It is bigger. It's less flexible. Um, and it does some really interesting things when it binds to its receptor in that it becomes more bent when it binds. Um, so potentially the fab arms are orientated differently, which might mean it interacts with antigens differently. There's so much that's of interest that we, we want to explore and will be different for every single tumor associated antigen that we're looking at. Um, I think in terms of the tissue penetration, it goes back to my point about we our hypothesis is that the way that the IgE gets the tumor and what drives uh, the mechanism really is that it is being trafficked there by those immune effector cells and that it very quickly binds and is retained on those key effector cells and that's how it has its action. And a related question is, will a therapeutic IgE antibody be more effective than IgG for liquid tumors? And do you believe mast cells also play a role in restricting tumors? Okay, so for liquid tumors, oh, I don't know. Well, we've really thought about solid tumors for the reason that I've just been discussing. So the characteristic of IgE and where it could be more beneficial to IgG in terms of tumor um, residency. In terms of the circulation, I think it's a different story. I don't know whether it would offer the same benefits over IgG. And I would also be cautious to say it may be that IgG isn't, benef doesn't, isn't superior to IgG when it comes to solid tumors. It may just be another toolkit, tool within the toolkit. Um, and I guess you would have questions about if it wasn't cleared from the circulation if it was cleared from the circulation by the immune cells, would that be an issue if you actually wanted it to stay in the circulation? Mast cells, yes. I mean, mast cells are found in tissues. We would think that they would be a role. Uh, there would be a role for them in the, these um, studies. We did look for mast cells and we didn't actually find very many um, being engaged by our therapeutic um, IgEs. Uh, that doesn't mean they're not there. We may just have been lucky, unlucky and not been able to find them. And I think we have to look in every single model that we run uh, because it may be different for different cancers as well. Next, <clears throat> Next question. IgE will likely improve efficacy versus IgG1 anti-cancer therapeutic antibodies versus the same tumor associated or tumor specific antigen. This could lead to increased tumor lysis syndrome. Would you recommend A, engineering the FC effector functions or, or and B, dialing down the Ig or, or uh, antigen binding affinity as the strategy for managing TLS in the clinic for IgE maps? Cool. Um, <laughs> I mean, amazing questions, things I haven't even thought about. Um, so thank you uh, for bringing it up. Um, maybe, yes. I mean, affinity to the antigen is something that we don't know how important that is. And I think uh, whether we can get away with IgEs with a lower affinity to the antigen than you could with an IgG, I don't know. We don't know how important that is affinity to the antigen, epitope that you choose. I think that's important to any backbone. And it, But yes, you're right. I think it, the answers may be different when it comes to IgE to IgG, but we just, I, I don't know. I'm afraid I don't know, but that's really interesting thoughts. Thank you. In the folate receptor alpha autoantibody experiment was a profiling of FC isotyping or subclassing performed before treatment with the MOV18 IgE? Uh, yeah, so we, when we looked at soluble folate receptor alpha and anti-folate receptor alpha autoantibodies, we took samples at baseline and throughout the trial, but we didn't actually assess them until the end. So it wasn't in any way a screening. Um, and then when we looked at the 
anti-folate receptor alpha autoantibodies, we looked at all IgG. We have not done a breakdown of um, IgG subclasses. I think that would be interesting to do. Um, I haven't shown it here, so I have another a paper um, published in BJC where we did an observational study looking at serum folate receptor alpha and autoantibodies in a large ovarian cohort and, and considered uh, tumor burden. And what was interesting there is that you can actually detect antifolate receptor alpha IgG autoantibodies just as at the same rate in healthy volunteers as you can in ovarian cancer patients. So what they're doing, why indiv healthy individuals without ov diagnosed ovarian cancer have have those autoantibodies for, we're not sure. I mean, it's a whole other avenue of research. But subclass would be really interesting as part of that. Next question. Did you do any investigations of IgE bound to monocytes or macrophages by, by flow cytometry? Yeah, we'd love to do that. That's something we'd really like to do. Um, we haven't been able to do it yet, but it's we'd love to because we want to show um, does Ig bind to the monocyte macrophages in the trial patients in the circulation? Uh, and then, you know, a subsequent study would be, you know, can you see that in the tumour as well? But that involves taking biopsies and taking biopsies from these clinical trial patients is quite difficult. So, yeah, two, two parts of the question and we'd really like to do it and we're hoping we can do it at some point. Comparing between IgG and IgE-based therapeutics, how do you think or what do you think of the chance of developing resistance or hypersensitivity in case of long-term usage? I don't know. I think if you were to develop ADAs as part of long-term usage, that could be a mechanism for developing hypersensitivity. Um, I don't know about other mechanisms, whether that would be they would be triggered by the treatment itself. Um, I don't know. The, the, we, we gave very maximum nine doses, so six weekly doses and then um, fortnightly, three fortnightly um, within this trial. Um, I think subsequent trials will be able to dose for longer, so these are things that we can start to look at. Uh, I think this question is related to timing of the treatment. At what mm -hmm. status would the IgE be efficient in a human cancer patient? Would this be more earlier stage or late stage uh, in terms of the staging of the cancer, I believe is, mm -hmm. is what they're getting at. Mm. Uh, so with a phase one clinical trial, the patients are always going to be heavily pretreated. So that's that's what we've... we've um, where we've treated and that will be the case for subs for the next trial at least. Um, in terms of selecting patients where we think uh, um, you know we might see better efficacy, I'm not sure. Really we need to ensure that the patient has a, a good number of immune cells with good number of Ig receptors expressed and that those immune cells have the capacity to be targeted. So you know in our ADCC assays in vitro where we've um, derived cells from cancer patients, uh, we've performed those experiments with heavily pretreated individuals. But you know perhaps we could do a study um, ex vivo where we look at individuals that are much less uh, heavily treated and see if their uh, immune cells have different capacity uh, to trigger that killing. I'm, I'm not sure. Great question. <laughs> Next question is on the, again, you, you touched on this, the reason for the anaphylaxis, but this is specifically, what do you think is the reason for anaphylaxis in patients with positive basophil activation tests in the absence of the antigen folate receptor alpha autoantibodies against it and alpha-gal? Well, like I say, I think uh, we haven't closed the story on alpha-gal in my view uh, because the the, uh, the tools that are readily available are to measure anti-alpha-gal IgE and that makes sense because no one else 
everyone else needs the, it to be an IgE. Uh, we've got the IgE. Our therapeutic is the IgE, so it could be any other cross-linking. Um, and I think it's not just alpha-gal. There could be other sugars, especially because IgE is so heavily glycosylated. And this, I guess, comes from the fact that MOV18 is, you know, maybe we have a higher chance for these mechanisms and for this hypersensitivity because MOV18 is produced in sp20 cells. I think that was done because his, all of the preclinical work had been um, generated or, or produced with MOV18 IG generated in that expression system. And so, of course, we didn't want to make a huge change to the antibody going forward into the clinical trial. But I think in the future, we we would be looking to consider other expression systems like HEC or CHO, um, because that might at least limit these kinds of possibilities. Um, yeah. Next question asks you to explain a bit more about the potential for cross-linking of alpha-gal on MOV IgE. Okay. Yeah. I think maybe I could done, I could have done with a better schematic on this. So, um, but if you imagine a basophil um, with its Ig receptors, MOV18 will bind to those basophils. We've shown that in the bat, and we believe that that will happen in the patient. Um, so if an individual's then got a, an anti-alpha-gal antibody, whether it's IgE, IgG, anything else, that that can come in as a cross-linker to the IgEs and, and forms a, a cross-linking agent. Uh, in the case of cetuximab, it would be that the patient's basophils have endogenous um, anti-alpha-gal IgE that they have um, developed uh, humorally anyway, uh, that are, all, that are uh, occupying some of those FCX1 receptors on the basophil. And then cetuximab, I guess, comes in and, and you know, can, can cross-link that because it's decorated with them. Um, so, that would be the mechanism. I hope that that's clear. I hope that that answered the question, if that was what the question is. If not, you can always contact me and I'll try and answer a bit better, one-to-one. -one. Question about glycosylation. How does glycosylation impact IgE's effector function? Uh, uh, that's a whole project in itself. Um, it's not something I've worked on um, at all, but it's something that is definitely within our... Uh, uh, in our minds and is something um, that we'd love to find out more about. Yeah, absolutely. Someone's asking about the uh, dose escalation model. Just out of curiosity, was the three plus three dose escalation model used or was the CRM approach used in this study? Yeah, it was three plus three. That was easy. <laughs> Another, I think, should be easy. Uh, question, because I, I think you kind of addressed this already. Uh, why were CHO cells not used for the expression of the MOV18 IgE? Yeah, it's because, I mean, this work has been ongoing since the 90s. And so MOV18 was originally, there was a hybridoma, SP20 hybridoma. Um, that's what a lot of the preclinical, or all of the preclinical work um, was performed. So we didn't want to change that for the clinical trial, but we would consider other expression systems. Can I just also go back to the glycosylation efficacy question? My, you know, your your brain always continues going, doesn't it? So there are some interesting studies if you're if you're interested in that where they've made people have engineered IgEs in plant-based engineering systems, which in themselves are amazing. And they've looked a little bit about how glycosylation could um, change uh, the efficacy of those IgEs. Um, I think Shade might be one of the um, the first authors, um, Morales. Um, yeah, so maybe have a little look on those if that's your interest. Uh, and another quick question, which I think I can answer myself at this point. Uh, what cell line did you use to express the IgE monoclonals? Wait a minute, let me guess. SV20s. Yeah. <laughs> Correct? Old stars, yeah. <laughs> I was well, it's an important question. Clearly, people, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, next question What kind of assay have you used to show biological activity of the product that was administered to patients? Okay, so we did a huge amount of um, validation of 
the um, IMP, the, all of the batches that were made as part of the production workup. Um, so when CRUK became the sponsor, they developed the, the GMP production of MOV18 IG, and they would send us um, all of their batches for their process development um, all the way up to the IMP. So what was put into a glass vial, and then that would be put into a bag to be administered to the patient. So we did um, cell surface, bi well, by physical assessment, cell surface binding to FC, epsilon, receptor expressing cells and target expressing cancer cells, degranulation, ADCC, ADCP assays with human monocytic cells. So all of those absolutely that was fully validated to ensure that it matched all of the preclinical work that we've done ahead of the clinical trial. Okay, last question, which I have to admit is a little bit cryptic to me. What about patients with HAE and apologies for the ignorance, I don't know what HAE is, what is it? What about patients with HAE? <laughs> If you're still there, could you spell it out? <laughs> Sorry. It's a bit, it's, for me, it's it's the end of it's a long day, but I mean, <laughs> not for everyone. HAE no. is that a hypersensitivity associated thing? I, no, I'm not sure. Well, we'll have to leave that one as a, as an unanswered question. Oh. <laughs> Oh, oh, thank you. Hereditary an angioedema. Thanks everyone. <laughs> um, pass. Uh, I, I'm not a clinician. That's sort of, um, I don't know. I have no idea. But perhaps you can drop me an email and let me know why you were think why you asked the question. And then I can understand it a bit better and see if I can think about it at least. That would okay. be great. Thank you for your question, though. Uh, perfect. Thank you. Well, uh, yes, thank you. Thanks, everyone, for your, your participation here. Uh, in concluding, I'd like to thank Dr. Bax for providing all of these insights into the use of IgE antibodies as cancer drugs and congratulate her again on winning the 2023 Houston Award. I'd also like to thank you for joining and participating in the webinar today. An on-demand version will be available soon. I'll send a link to it via email to everyone who registered. Please feel free to watch this or any of our on-demand webinars when it's convenient. Thanks again and have a great rest of your day.